welcome to our review on free body diagrams. So when we talk about a free body diagram, we're using these to show the forces that act on a single object. So it's a simplified diagram where we're usually going to represent the object by a dot or a box. And then from there, we've got the force arrows that represent the forces that act on that object. So when it comes to drawing one of these free body diagrams, there are three steps that we need to carry out. Step one, we need to identify all the non-contact pairs. And in the example I've given you there of a book, then it's the force of the earth on the book and the force of the book on the earth. So that's our non-contact pair, it's the only one. Step two, we identify all the contact pairs. And in this example, we've got the force of the table on the book and the force of the book on the table. And then we focus on our single ob object, which in this case, the book. Once we've got that, we draw the object as either a box or a circle. So we've got that bit first of all. And then we draw the arrows that represent the forces that act on that object. So we're only looking for the forces that are acting on the book in this case. So the upward arrow we've drawn is the force of the table on the book and the downward arrow is the force of the earth on the book. The other two are acting on other things, so we're not concerned with them. Another term we need to know the meaning of is the term resultant force or net force, which is just the force when two or more forces are added together as vectors. So this is something you've probably encountered back in key stage three but maybe didn't associate the term resultant force with it. So I've given you an example at the bottom there. The first one we can see is five newtons acting towards the left, five newtons in the opposite direction. So when we add those together as vectors, remember one would have a positive sign, the other would be negative. Therefore, the resultant force is zero because they cancel out. The one just beneath with three newtons to the left and five newtons to the right, then we'd have a resultant force of two newtons to the right because obviously when we add them together the three is negative the five is positive so we have a two newton resultant force when we have resultant forces it's not always going to be a nice simple case of they're in opposite directions to each other so we literally just add them Instead, we can actually have forces that act at different angles to each other. Now, in order to calculate the resultant force in this scenario, then we're going to be using Pythagoras theorem. So this is, of course, bringing in some fun maths. And I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, why are we doing maths? This is science. And the answer is it all overlaps, folks. So we can use Pythagoras's theorem to calculate our resultant force of these two forces acting at 90 degrees to each other. The kind of question they could ask you is this one here. Calculate the resultant force of a two Newton force and a five Newton force acting at 90 degrees to each other. So if you had that kind of question, first thing, the big hint would be that they'd give you a piece of graph paper printed in the exam booklet to use. The first thing we need to do is draw a diagram to show those forces. So we know that we've got a two Newton force and a five Newton force at 90 degrees to each other. So the five Newton force is represented by B on the diagram there. And remember to use a scale. They've given you graph paper because they want you to use the number of squares. Then a two Newton force at 90 degrees is A. And that gives us the two parts of our triangle, which we can then join with line C. And what do you know, we've got the setup just like you would in maths when you're doing any problem using Pythagoras. The next thing we need to do is bring in Pythagoras' theorem to work out the hypotenuse. Hopefully we remember that c squared is a squared plus b squared. Substitute in our values. So we've got 2 squared plus 5 squared. And then work it out gives us 29 newtons squared for our c. Obviously, if we just want to know C on its own, we need to take the square root. So the square root of 29 gives us C as 5.4 newtons, which is our resultant force. The last thing we need to be able to do is resolve forces. So you can actually work out which two forces at right angles add up to a particular force by resolving them in two directions. 
So what you'd end up doing is drawing the force and the angle on graph paper and then using your ruler to work out the components. So to give you an example of this, which is sometimes a bit easier to visualise, you can have a question along the lines of resolve a force of 50 newtons acting at an angle of 40 degrees into two components. First thing we need to do is select a suitable scale. So it might be something along the lines of using one centimetre to represent 10 newtons. You then mark your start point on the graph paper and measure 40 degrees and mark that off as well. You then draw your five centimetre line at 40 degrees to represent your 50 newtons in this case. And then once you've got that, you draw two other lines to make a right angle triangle, which are represented by the red and the blue on the left there. Because you've drawn this to scale, that then means that you can just measure your red line and your blue line and then just remembering to use your scale, obviously, you can work out the force of each line. Hopefully at the end of this video, you can describe examples of the forces acting on an object or a system. You can use a free body diagram to describe how two or more forces lead to a resultant force on an object, and you can draw that free body diagram. And you can use vector diagrams to show the resolution of forces a net force and also equilibrium situations.